invite you to settle in, be comfortable, be open to the possibility of saying yes. Straight spine, down the floor, if you feel tall and you feel comfortable with that, close your eyes. Let's just take a moment to feel. This is a forgiveness for you. So take a deep breath. Breathe in. Hold it. Relax your shoulders. Let you feel or be aware of any place in your body that you're holding tension. Don't study it. Just be with it. And release that breath. Now notice who or what comes up for you into your mind, into your awareness. Take one more breath. Breath of life. It connects us to the present moment. Breathing in your own rhythm and holding that image. That's your image. Hold the image. I invite you to review the past 24 hours of your life experience. And notice any time that you felt anger or judgment for anyone or anything, including yourself. If you need to go beyond 24 hours, please do. You will know. Go there. Now select one person or circumstance or event where forgiveness is possible. Notice what you feel emotionally. How does emotion present itself in your physical body? What sensations do you feel? Notice them, acknowledge them, and release them. Or be open to the idea that release is possible. Now ask yourself, am I ready to forgive? This is time to be honest, authentic. If the answer is no, so be it. It's just not time. It's not the right time. If that's the case, I invite you to select another person or circumstance. And when you find and experience to forgive, Invite your higher power, your divine nature, to assist you in this forgiveness process. Again, I ask, am I willing to be responsible in my own feelings in this experience? It may be difficult what happened, but you have your own space in this circumstance as well. Ask, am I willing to be responsible for my response? or my reaction? Am I willing to be responsible for my judgment, for my condemnation, for my belief that this person or circumstance may need to be punished? Forgiveness is always good. It doesn't mean that we will never hold someone accountable for their actions. It means that I'm willing to be responsible for myself in this. I am responsible for the feelings that cause me anxiety, angst, and suffering. I am responsible for the preoccupation of this unforgiveness. Now feel your feelings. I know it's intimate. I know it's deep. I know it's a challenge. But feel your feelings. Experience them in your body. Be open to the present, to whatever that may be. Be open to it right here in this beautiful sanctuary. This place of confidence and safety where you're held as the divine, by the divine, as the divine. And be open to any feelings that arise without judgment, to 
control it, all you need to fade to fix it. Just give it to spirit, to our universal intelligence. Just let the dew that evaporates under the morning sun, let it dissipate. Release it and let it go. Be present and open. That's our work here. Be present and open. That's your work here. Yes. Now take another breath. Deep breath in. And feel. Is there any judgment, controlling, or condemning that you're willing to release? Willing to let go of? Breathe in and be aware. Be willing to let go of any attachment <coughs> of this feeling, this unprotected, any attachment of this pain here. Go look into the place that knows the truth of who you are. Regardless of the feelings, the experience, or the expectations, go to your heart, the truth of your being. Open up to this. When we say yes to possibility, we release all of it. Just by saying yes to the possibility. Saying yes to the possibility of forgiveness offers an opening to move through the process now. Right here. So breathe again. Let us hear you breathe. We breathe here and feel the release that is simply for us alone. For we are lighter as we open our hearts to the gratitude that all is forgiven in the truth. All is forgiven in the truth. Say, I know my truth now. Release all of this.
stepping into what grace does. Love that. Thank you. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> love you guys. Love you, love you, love you. I woke up this morning and what came to me was a thaw after the, after the freeze. It just felt like this thaw and I thought, well, how appropriate because we are thawing when we're in this grace and compassion and forgiveness. It's this thaw. It's a melting away of stuff. One of my favorite words, stuff. And um, so uh, we're going to talk about the third mainstay. Um, for those of you who may not have been here before, um, I'm talking about my upcoming book and the mainstays of regret-free living. There are four of them, and we're on the third one. And uh, a mainstay is those constants, those pillars, those um, foundations in our lives that are influenced by all of these essential influencers, these facets of our life, the relationships, the conversations, and all the, all the things that we do, and how we do them, how we respond and react, like I talked about in the meditation. Uh, a mainstay, as in the mainstay of the ship, in this case, your ship, is always in forward motion, always in movement. So when we talk about compassion, grace, and forgiveness, when you say those three words, which one actually pops up? Which one really stares you in the face? Forgiveness. Which comes first? Well, as I'll talk about, and we will actually experience in the workshop today, is that you cannot have one without the other because one leads to the other. But forgiveness, um, that kind of a biggie. That's a biggie. And there are, there's only one forgiveness. We, we kind of think there's all these different kinds of forgiveness. But forgiveness is one thing. Unforgiveness is one thing. But there are different facets in our life and levels of forgiveness, right? We've talked about relationship with the self. Forgiveness of the self is actually the main kind of forgiveness that we need to do in order to be whole and to forgive anyone or anything else in any other circumstance in our life. Of course, then there's forgiveness of those who we may have perceived have done us harm. And then the forgiveness which is not tangible, global forgiveness. I personally practice daily forgiving our world leaders, injustices, um, climate change, the things that have all come about um, to keep my own sanity, but it is a private declaration in and of itself for me, and I think a lot of people do that in their own way as well. So, Throughout my work um, with end-of-life patients and their families, um, forgiveness by far was the heaviest source of spiritual pain at the time, at end-of-life. Many would think it would be hope, and I've talked about that before, but only 8% of people were holding up a space for hope. 58% were enthralled, engaged, preoccupied, or embracing the idea of forgiveness of self or another. 58% at the time of, of, of uh, dying. And, um, you know, uh, some people, um, of course, for a lot of us, it's those shoulda, coulda, woulda, things that should, could have been said that we didn't do or held on to. Some people knew not how to move through that forgiveness, and so they chose not to. Making that final exit a little bit more different than for others. The exit in and of itself is pretty much the same. Same things are happening to each of us, but what we've done in the gap of all things that I call this living, we take that with us. And that becomes accumulated and very accentuated at the end of life. So, and it takes up a great deal of energy for the dying in those final days and hours. <coughs> and so I talk about this forgiveness and the living, remembering that it's more about how we live but we are always, this is a writer downer, we are always preparing for the final exit. Like it or not, we're always winning at the game we're playing, even if we don't like what winning looks like. But we get a choice. We have a choice of how that looks now. So again and again, I saw people clamor um, to get all of their needs met, to get forgiving or unforgiveness out of the way before that exit. And as I said, some people knew how to do it, or they had already done it, and some chose to not. 
But the release um, and the allowing for a person who's leaving this earth has a huge statement and impact on the people that they leave behind. It changes the way we view dying and death and the resistance and the fear behind that. It changes that to even a more gentler way of leaving. And for generations, think about this, generations to come. How they view this dying, how they view regret and regret-free living, which is really what this is all about. So I wanted to remind you that, again, this is about living, living better, what I call the secret sauce inside this gap of all things. And, you know, we, um, forgiveness and unforgiveness, it's a, it's a deep thing, right? It's probably one of the main things that we avoid, that we have resistance to. We say, oh, I can do that another day. This is not a good time, right? Um, but uh, I know that we've seen and been inspired by books that we've read, movies, everyone watches series. You know, even in our personal lives with some of our, um, our own personal relationships or watching personal relationships who have done forgiveness or, or watched what happens when we do that. So I believe that the most impact is in the stories. And the beauty of the work that I did at End of Life um, with folks um, was all the stories. And I want to share with, the story, uh, share with you a story today about a woman named Marion which to this day has had one of the greatest impacts on my life, and it happened in just the first few weeks, believe it or not, of my hospice um, work when that began. So I'd like to read you um, the story about Marion. Marion, one of the most impactful experiences I witnessed as a death doula, has never left my velvet room ahas and insights. This is a story of compassion and grace which always opens the door of forgiveness. Marion was a strong-willed woman. She was as independent as they, as they come. In fact, she journeyed through her life continually battling cancer. She spent much of this battle, as she called it, in secret. She was married and she and her husband had six children together. Having been ill and exhausted with the fight to live throughout her entire adult life, she had emotionally dis distanced herself from her children and her gentle husband of 60 plus years. Marion had breast cancer. She had concealed an ulcerated tumor the size of a grapefruit from her children. Her husband was sworn to secrecy. This was not an unfamiliar form of denial that I had witnessed, having worked in women's health care for 20 plus years. When Mary and I first met, she could no longer hide the tumor or the order that divulged its existence. She was in a great deal of pain and needed this pain to be managed. She had had, she had her rosary with her at this time, and she explained to me, this is probably enough. She asked me what my religion was, and I replied, all the paths that lead to the light. She looked at me, smiled, and said, well, maybe you're my enough. We had a bond immediately, and it was no secret that she would be uh, a challenging presence to walk to the light. I knew this experience would make a mark on my ability to embrace her with my gifts, but I had no idea how profoundly grace would play a part in the unfolding of this passage. Marion was clearly exhausting her time here. Her children shared the stories of their mother with me. Many were stories of the gardens that she kept and the crafts that she made. Marion was most proud of the prayer shells that she crocheted and gave to folks in need. They also shared some of their resentments of her as well as their unhappiness with her controlling nature <coughs> right up to the end. One of Marion's sons had the most distant of all relationships along with his own share of years of resentment and unforgiveness. I had several conversations with him about opening up to his mother. However, he had not done so during these last days. He showed up daily with his spouse and sat with his family in his own quiet demeanor. On day 17 of Marion's hospice care, her body began to release her cancer from several orifices, as cancer often does. We needed to change her linens, but moving her back and forth was very painful for her. I saw in my mind's eye what needed to happen.
Marion looked at me as if to have given me the vision of what to do next. Now I need to paint the picture of this scene as this is what grace and human compassion are all about. The room was full with the stench of cancer, the linens on the bed were enthralled in the release of her body fluids. She was experiencing intense levels of pain even when medication should have rendered her sleeping. Sometimes this happens and pain control is challenging, especially for an individual who has had increased levels of pain for decades. The brain is simply on high alert. There were at least six people in the room, all wanting to make Marion more comfortable but beside themselves to do so. I looked at one of her daughters and I told her that I would return in a moment. I went out to the front yard where some of the family members had gathered to support one another. I reached out to Marion's son, the one that had been angry at her for most of his life. And I said, I need your help. Your mom needs your help. He looked at me and asked me what I meant. I explained to him what was happening in the bedroom where his mother lay dying. I painted the picture of what was unfolding and what needed to be done for her comfort mm -hmm. and for her dignity. Mm -hmm. He looked at me with fear in his eyes and said, I don't think I can do that. Now I'm never forceful in these situations. However, I had already seen the vision of him lifting his mother so that what needed to be done could be done. I knew that he would do what he felt he could not. I knew that he would do what I requested of him. He followed me to the bedroom, and as we walked in, the room became silent. Marion's moans ceased in that moment as well. His siblings, with tear-filled eyes, stepped back to make room for their brother to approach their mother's bedside. I asked Sam to lift his mother from the bed so that the nurses could change her bedding and remove and change her so soiled clothing while in his arms. The minutes that followed were some of the most moving emotions that I've ever experienced. Sam picked his mother up from the bed and he cradled her in his arms. Our eyes met and he began to cry. As he held his mom close, he wept. I whispered in his mother's ear that Sam was holding her and that all was going to be okay. His cheek met hers and he told her that he loved her. The entire room felt the transformation that took place in that moment. His moment of transformation touched each of her children and her husband as well. The grace and the compassion that this moment brought forth was a healing of many childhood wounds, his and his wife's. They stood in disbelief as Sam gently placed his mother on the clean bed to rest her body in her remaining hours. Marion became conscious for a brief moment, and she motioned for me to come close. Her family left the room and situated themselves in the living room while I stayed and prayed with Marion. I had the sense that in that moment, Marion had regained her dignity on a number of levels, and she desired to die in the stillness of her own being. I kissed her forehead, and I walked out to join the family, closing the bedroom door behind me. I sat next to Sam, and he gave me a gentle hug of gratitude. And then, something happened. The bedroom door opened on its own, and we all looked at one another in amazement and disbelief. I stood first, and entered the room where Marianne lay light. She left in the way that she had requested in the stillness of a moment with herself only. Marion made her transition from this world to her journey beyond within an hour after her son Sam had experienced his loving bond of closure and acceptance through grace and compassion leading to much needed forgiveness. This way of dying well is a beautiful testimonial to this family and I can say that it will be carried on through generations to come for certain. In the days that followed, they spoke of the acceptance and the beauty that can be had while assisting another in their end of life and birthing out journey. Marion was only in hospice care for 17 days. I find it a small miracle that the many years of dysfunction and spiritual pain experienced by every family, family member present seemed to be washed away in a small wrinkle of time by one brief and profound act of intimacy between a mother 
I'm often reminded of Marion and her family as they gifted me with a beautiful prayer shawl that gently says, thank you. Thank you for seeing me to the light in this way. The freedom of forgiveness. Our human experience has us visiting our head much more than we are in our hearts. For this reason, we create stories and we hold on to them. They become a way of life and ultimately our way of death. Forgiveness itself exists on so many levels. It's not just our personal relationships, but our politics, the way we view the world today and everything in between within the gap of everything I call living. So I encourage you to get clear, get really clear on what needs to be released, a must do, in order to move forward with our dreams, goals, and preconceived desires. Resentments can take up more space from the inside out than you can ever imagine. And when you release, you make room for an allowing to occur. You will find out just how heavy these things you've been carrying actually are. You create a shift in your own consciousness and the ripple goes so far out beyond you. Another way that you pay you forward. What we do now in the gap of all things of our living, it's a telltale of our delicious experiences that we can look forward to that we look and feel like offering a tapestry of memories, ahas, and insights of a life lived well, and of open doors to regret-free living. This, of course, is the recipe of the secret sauce that allows for an end of life, one with anticipation. That, in fact, is quite possible. Compassion, grace, and forgiveness, which comes first? Well, you cannot have one without the other. Ask yourself, what is really important and build your life around that answer. Forgiveness is always its own reward. Forgiveness is an essential part of our transformation. It's part of the dance that I continue to talk about. Find forgiveness in the stories. Um, come to the workshop today and, and feel the experience of grace, compassion, self-compassion. And um, it'll be very experiential to find out some of these things in 24 hours. You can only imagine what builds up in a 24 hour period of time that we don't address, that we don't look at, and imagine over time what that is. And when we hold on to those things, we take up space, lots of space. I like to talk about this big, beautiful velvet canvas, big black hole. Oftentimes, you might think about that as so lovely. But think about you in the driver's seat, big, beautiful black hole, and you get to drop in all of these pieces of light. The light, the talent, the gifts of who you are. And every time you release something heavy, you replace it with the light. Yeah. So I'd like to close with um, a reading <coughs> called The Autobiography in Five Chapters by Portia Nelson. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in it. I'm lost. I am hopeless. And it isn't my fault. It takes forever to find my way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. And it still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. Ha! Huh, it's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. And it is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down another street. <laughs> so it is.